third panel. Welcome, because people are still on lunch, but we are we cannot wait for, for them anymore because it's already 15 minutes past three. Uh, this is our third panel uh, with the title Is Another Europe uh, Possible? Of course, it will be some kind of continuation of the previous debates because few or three fundamental issues are already raised up and it's very hard to avoid, uh, hard to avoid them. The participants on this panel are uh, Gaspar Miklos Tamas, philosopher from Hungary, uh, Alessandro Mekozzi, a trade unionist from Italy, uh, Walter Bayer from Vienna from Transform Group, uh, Karl Friedrich Fridrikson from the Eurozine, and uh, Etienne Lebeau, uh, trade unions from, from Belgium. Uh, so the title is, is another uh, Europe uh, possible. In this panel, we will try to give some more accent to these uh, debates or maybe false dilemmas between the struggle on the, concerning the crisis of the Eurozone, struggle on the on national level and on the European level. First, this may, I can say maybe this major contradiction between uh, material structural uh, relations in the European Union concerning institutions, concerning uh, economic relations between core and periphery, and this kind of, let's put it that, that, that way, uh, ideological field of ideolo ideology of Europeanism and this fear that most of the left have of if they fight on the national level, the nationalism will uh, uh, rise up. So if we uh, somehow uh, put a perspective of the social, social rights and workers' rights, from that perspective, we can say that the nation states are still the only uh, mechanisms and uh, in the nation sense we can find the only mechanisms and institutional uh, protocols that give some uh, that still held this kind of social rights and workers rights and the only uh, protocols that can you can really engage in the in fighting for these rights because the European institution if you know the history from the Maastricht on uh, they function was the only function was to evade uh, the locus of cross struggle in the institutional field of the nation state, which, which can say during the 50s and the 60s, the gains of the working, working class through Europe uh, were institutionalized through the nation state. So my question for the panelists will be how to, uh, to tackle this problem, this contradiction between the real material infrastructural situation and this ideology, especially concerning this false dilemma, Europeanism, uh, nationalism. Uh, I want to start with uh, Gaspar Miklos Tamas to put his short statement on the problem. Of course, you, you can uh, put some maybe perspective from, uh, from the, you can articulate some Hungarian perspective, especially because of the problem of the periphery and the problem of Viktor Orban and the uh, commission, uh, with the, and the commission's uh, relations to the, these problems in Hungary. So please, short statement, about five to six minutes and also everyone after it. Yeah, here is the mic. Well, um, at the risk of stating the obvious, um, we are talking in a place that has been the theater of the last European war, and uh, to date. And um, so we should really take seriously um, the idea which is behind the European construction, which aims at peace and the avoidance of armed conflict and the creation of a sort of civilization and a political structure that might avoid such conflicts. And this is, was, and still is one of the main attraction for people of various political outlooks to invest some of the political energies in some kind of European construction. And I should uh, emphasize this because I would uh, launch myself very shortly into an apologia of the idea of national self-determination. And um, the two things, I think, um, uh, the question of war and peace uh, the question of uh, imperial and national and ethnic uh, conflicts combined with the class struggles on the one hand, um, uh, which uh, you know European Union 
serves, of course, this double task, to avoid war and to avoid revolution. These are the two main functions of this institution. Understandably, since it's an institution of bourgeois democracy, therefore, it is supposed to defend that. Um, on the other hand, if we take the democratic ideal seriously for a moment, which people on the whole don't, then we should uh, consider the very elementary fact that the basic idea of any kind of modernist idea, modern idea of freedom, is of course the idea of autonomy, which, to simplify, would mean that the freer we are, the more the subject and the object of power coincide. And uh, as opposed to heteronomy, right? So the idea of the 19th century, in which not only the rule of uh, aristocratic and priestly castes was opposed, but also rule by foreigners, by foreign courts, foreign dynasties, supranational entities such as the, uh, the whole construction of the Holy Alliance. We should not forget, especially here in, in, in Central Europe, that 1848 was a revolution against international reaction, against the Holy Alliance, and at that time the idea of national self-determination was the idea of progress. You know, the Garibaldis and the Marcinis and the Kossuths and so on. I won't include Ialacis in that, but, but uh, just, you know, just in parenthesis. All right. All right, yeah. And, uh, but it's really, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this. And so I, and I think that even today, uh, to be ruled by institutions and authorities you cannot control is indeed you know, very simply in contradiction with the most elementary idea of democracy. You know, the, and at the moment, of course, there are many instances, many authorities, many forces alien to the citizens that are being ruled, who are being ruled, who rule them. You know, some of them are formal, some of them are informal. There are a plethora of in international organizations about which citizens of all countries exercise no control, you know, WTO and such like. And, um, and also, of course, the informal influence of international capital, and also the uh, aspect of nation-state politics, um, especially military and uh, financial regulation and so on, where even national governments decide issues in cooperation with foreign elites that are supposed to be accepted without any further ado by national parliaments. Uh, we haven't seen in the last 40 years national parliaments really questioning NATO strategy. A little bit of murmuring here and there, but on the whole, there were. So, so I think that a uh, uh, genuinely democratic and a genuinely socialist strategy about Europe has to take this into account when judging when to prefer uh, supranational solutions and when to prefer nation state solutions. Uh, the guiding principle, I should think, would, should be the idea of autonomy. And, uh, and also, of course, you know, the, the welfare and the safety of the concerned. It would be perfectly impractical and, and hypocritical not to be aware on, in this continent of the fact that national passions, even if morally justified, even if politically very well motivated, can of course become very dangerous. But this sentence I just pronounced, of course, is always, you know, the sentence also pronounced by supranational bureaucrats who would, of course, legitimize their unelected uh, policy making and their interference in popular will with this. We shouldn't give in 
to, to such rhetoric, but at the same time being aware of the extreme danger of conflicts. And I really, I don't have to tell you in Zagreb how those things uh, can look like. And um, so, um, so what I think is that it would be the um, quite obvious as a phrase, quite obvious phrase that, you know, the European left should aim at a transformation of the European Union and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. Most people tend towards a, an upkeep of the European Union by making it more social, more responsive, more responsible, more democratic, more social. Well, let me add to this in order to um, aim at sincerity. What kind of European construction is that which excludes some European countries? I don't believe in any European construction in which Russia plays no role. If Russia is not a European country, which country is? And this you know, major European power has always been and still is. And also countries in the Russian orbit uh, are also European countries and this uh, uh, union could become uh, egalitarian in the national sense, i.e. equality between peoples. This is also something forgotten, that you know, progressive forces in the past were supposed to aim at equality between nations, equality between countries, where you know, the richer and the stronger countries were not suppo su uh, supposed to lord it over the weaker and poorer ones. You know, it's time, it's high time to, to come back to, to old, the old, old uh, uh, wisdom of having equal rights, equal rights, and which um, at the moment don't seem to be quite the case in the European Union or anywhere. So I think that, yes, that's yes, the last sentence, yes. Uh, yeah. Later, the, just to put other participants to include okay. these points, because I, I'm finished. You, I'm, you get my drift. Okay. Uh, uh, so please, Alessandra, uh, can you tackle this problem from your perspective as uh, working as a trade unionist in Italy and how, how on the field this kind of contradictions between national and uh, supranational level concerning you know, the infrastructure and also concerning the ideology functions on the level of, let's say, uh, trade unions organizing on the European level and this. Okay, I try. But if I speak too much, you stop me, please. But, uh, okay, first of all, I want to say that, uh, yes, I am a trade unionist since uh, many, many years, because I'm very old. And at the same time, since some years, uh, I have not only I, but together with others of my union, that, by the way, is a metal workers' union in Italy, and is one of uh, the unions who are more... Uh, trying to resist, and I will say something about this. But uh, since, uh, I think, 2000 or 2001, or maybe 1999, uh, I've been and we have been uh, joining and uh, participating in the uh, general uh, movement that we call the movement of the movements that started um, uh, yes, I could say at Seattle in 1999 against the um, WTO. And uh, this because we really think, uh, and today maybe even more, we really think that uh, the situation, uh, in general, the situation of globalization and the impact of this on uh, people conditions, workers, and uh, in general citizens' conditions. Uh, and today, the strong uh, and very heavy crisis cannot have a single answer, neither at the national level, although national level, I will say something about our country, is quite important. Uh, but uh, they must have an answer at European and supranational level. So my answer to the question that is the title of our panel is yes. Is another Europe possible? And is yes because I think that we need another Europe. 
And when I talk about this, I mean uh, Europe society, Europe uh, citizenship, uh, European um, civil society, and of course, European politics. But I would like to uh, speak more from the point of view of uh, uh, civil society, and in particular also about uh, the, the workers' movement, labor movement, trade union movement, that are today in a very, very, uh, I think, uh, deep crisis. Deep crisis like everywhere, like the crisis of the movements, but the deep crisis is uh, uh, related to the fact that uh, uh, although at national level, and this is about your question, although at national level we have resistances, we have strong struggle, but we are in a situation, like an Italian professor says, that uh, there is a strong class struggle. But now the class, uh, uh, class struggle is uh, driven by the other part. It was for uh, tens and hundreds of years by the worker class. It is driven by the other, I would say, what is uh, the new holy alliance between uh, uh, international monetary fund uh, a European Commission, European Central Bank, and I would add the fourth. And the fourth uh, actor of this alliance is uh, the uh, system of uh, uh, economic financial power and in particular the multinationals. And I say this because the case of uh, Italy, that is not uh, the only case, but in Italy I think is uh, very, very visible today that the combination of uh, the attack, uh, economic uh, and social attack of uh, the multinational, uh, the case of Fiat in is Italy is, I think, more or less known. And Mr. Marchione, the, the CEO of uh, Fiat, uh, the combination of this with the austerity policies uh, today uh, represented and acted by the second M, the Monti government, is a very clear example of uh, how this uh, alliance uh, is, uh, um, deal is um, acting a class struggle where we are not now uh, winning, but is one of the reasons why we need not to be alone all together with uh, trade unions and social movements. Why? Because uh, in Italy, what the, the uh, attack to the rights, work rights, social rights, uh, citizen rights, uh, was first launched by exactly uh, the CEO of Fiat Marchione with a very heavy uh, um, blackmail to the workers, saying uh, these are my rules, these are my requests, either these are accepted in terms of uh, attack to the collective bargaining, attack to the uh, condition, work conditions, attack to the rights of the people, either you, do you accept this uh, or uh, I will go elsewhere. And this was the first point where, um, unfortunately, there was no a collective and unitarian uh, answer of the unions. We decided, as our union, we decided not to accept and not to sign. And we decided this because of the push of many workers who did not want to be submitted to this blackmail and to refuse. And we are in this situation today of resistance to an imposition of a very, very authoritarian model, social model. And this authoritarian social mo mo model, this cut of democracy inside the working place up to exclude the union who said no, our union, from the representation inside the workplace, so we are out. We are present because people are members, but uh, as a representation, we are out. This uh, attack to democracy was uh, 
very strongly supported also by the policy of um, the government, with the two, uh, mainly with the two big uh, so-called reforms that we call counter-reforms about uh, labor market, employment and workers' rights, and about uh, um, uh, pensions. About uh, work and labor market, was the, the reform, the so-called reform, that we expected to be uh, against the precarization of work is actually the contrary. Is uh, We have 46 type of contracts, and the 46 type of contracts are still there. Second, uh, dismissals, individual dismissals, are easier now because of the change of the law, the statute of workers' law. And third, the uh, counter-reform of pensions, that is uh, to bring the, the age of pensions up to 67 years. And this is, uh, uh, although they have been always talking about the, the needs of young people, the problem of work and employment for young people, of course, when you have such a reform, when people are obliged to go up to 67 years of, uh, uh, for the pension, this is against the employment. And this is true because the employment and the unemployment rate is growing in a very uh, strong way. So this, uh, um, to this, there is a opposition, resistance, and we think that th this is needed because uh, um, although the, uh, the, the, we believe that the risks are inside this kind of model and we have to change this kind of development model without a resistance that uh, try to uh, protect the rights that have been achieved uh, long uh, uh, 100 uh, years, uh, we will not be able at all to change any uh, part of this uh, or any uh, fundament of this uh, model. Last point, then I have more, but I want just to say last point on this because you asked about the European <coughs> answer. As I said, I think at uh, trade union level, uh, the crisis is very uh, clear. Uh, federation of trade unions that is uh, the only now the only one uh, actor in uh, Euro labor union uh, at the European level is very weak is actually not a union is a group of national unions together and who are the strongest decide what to do and what was impressive I mentioned just this case because uh, it's really uh, something that give an idea of how it works. Uh, when the struggle in Greece started, uh, it was uh, 2010, or before the decision of the European uh, Confederation of Trade Union to have a European uh, um, day of action, we cannot say European strike because it does not exist neither in the Nice uh, Charter of Rights nor in the Lisbon Treaty. It does not exist, and for many uh, countries, like Germany, for instance, just to say the most uh, powerful, is not allowed uh, the political strike, is not allowed the solidarity strike. So there was this uh, action, but before this, the Greek had been uh, fighting with several uh, general strikes. And then there was just one. So this to say that there is this weakness uh, at uh, institutional level, but what I think is uh, uh, more to take in account at, is that the, the solidarity among workers uh, is, of course, weakened by the situation of crisis, because everyone try, tries, of course, to keep their jobs, everyone is uh, if, um, frightened by the, the blackmails, because it's not only the fiat, but everywhere. This everyone is frightened by the attack to the collective and individual rights. So the, the question of solidarity and the rebuilding of a solidarity among workers and of workers 
together with other uh, movements and social movements is uh, quite urgent. And this one, also this of the reason why I think uh, we have to, um, to build up, uh, to rebuild up, uh, to <laughs> reconnect all the uh, actors, social actors uh, in Europe in order to have uh, a, a, another Europe. So the first other Europe must be it must come from ourselves. Okay, so uh, this problem of uh, getting solidarity between uh, workers across Europe is uh, maybe the most uh, the most problematic issue is this the kind of division of labor of on the, in terms of governance on the European level. European <coughs> institutions are concerned with the uh, monetary policy and the fiscal pact, and all, all what all what is left for the nation states is to attract capital concerning. Uh, uh, the labor, uh, diminishing the labor rights and the reduction of uh, of taxes. How how to uh, deal with this problem we raised uh, here concerning this maybe this division of labor on the. It's very hard to somehow to connect it in a concrete struggle. It's easy to connect it on an analytical level because if you have this monetary union and fiscal pact, all you have to do is uh, to attract capital with this uh, with these measures and that induce this kind of competitiveness between. Uh, different working classes of the different states, and some, and, and, and there is a problem that the working class of different states are, will, will not be, will not gain solidarity with the working classes across Europe, but with the ruling class of each on, of each country. Uh, uh, exactly, this is, uh, this is the problem, and I would say, uh, this is primarily a political and an ideological problem. And uh, I'm afraid that, um, firstly, when talking about the European Union, we have to deconstruct the myths which are connected with it. Normally, the story goes as follows. After 300 years of fierce wars, and the worst then in the 20th century, we, after 1945, decided to create the European Union in order to abolish national competition and contradictions uh, among nations. But this is not only the half of the story, because the Second World War was not only and not primarily a war between nations, it was a war between fascism and the civilized world. And fascism came up in the European societies because of world economic crisis. And world economic crisis came up because of the application of a social and economic model, which exactly is the same as it is now applied by the European Union policies. So the main idea, the main idea after 1945 was to create a political space based on an economic policy and on a social policy which would allow to compromise the interest of the uh, working classes and the ruling classes. And I would say that this is not a question of historical interest. This leads to the core of the problem of nowadays as um, the relation of power meanwhile has shifted in a, in a way that the ruling classes and the elites in the leading European countries decided to get rid of this. And of course the crisis has structural reasons and we must not underestimate the crisis. But what we see since 2008 and 2009 is increasingly that the crisis is not uh, the result of a class egoistic policy of the ruling uh, circles, but is also an instrument to enforce and to enhance these policies. And this we have, we have to cope with. And I tend to say that um, national questions always have to be tackled in a pragmatic way, meaning uh, we should not so much look into that what somebody may call a European identity or a national identity, I do not believe in the one or the either. Maybe I say this in a personal way. My father survived uh, a concentration camp. Then he came back to Austria and uh, he touched down in an environment where all the peoples who brought him to the concentration camp 
were still living. So what about national identity? It's about national difference. It's about fighting on interpretations of a nation's history and of a nation's future. And the same goes for Europe. And that's why I would say, if we talk about Europe, we should not be so keen to develop this European sentiment. We should look at it instrumentally. Yes, indeed, 40% of the gross national product of uh, an average uh, European society is distributed on a national state basis. And that's why we need democracy, that's why we need parliaments, that's why we need sovereignty. But at the same time, and this is the, the core idea of the European Union as it developed uh, after uh, the 80s and the 90s, and which is laid down in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, the context of this national disputes and distribution is set by European, not so much European institutions, but European markets, which of course are power relations. And the question is, how can we challenge these power relations, namely transnation, transnational capital, transnational corporations, financial uh, markets, and financial institutions on the European level. And this, of course, needs politics. And for the ruling class, and uh, by the way, Hayek's idea uh, was not to create strong European institutions. Hayek's idea was to leave the governance of uh, the economic space in Europe to the markets, including, by the way, uh, the private creation of money. So, it's always from, from the party of the suppressed and exploited classes that policy is, is required. And I would say, to come to an end to this first contribution, that uh, the challenge now is to create convergences between not only the different movements at the place, but also between the different political actors in order to accompany national struggles and national demands by a European perspective. And for the moment, I would say that one of the key issues of this European perspective is to be in that sense in solidarity with the Greeks, that their decision has to be respected by the European institutions. If, for example, the Greeks decided to leave the Euro, then of course the left would, would have to be solidary with them. But if the, the Greeks decide otherwise, the left has to defend the idea that not the Greeks have to change their attitudes towards austerity, but the European Union has to change their attitudes towards the Greeks. And this, I would say, this is the challenge, because at the end of the day, national consensus or transnational consensus consists in agreeing that a certain transfer of resources from one class to the other, from one region to the other, has to take place. And the political and the cultural weakness of the European left actors consists exactly in that, that we don't want or we don't dare to touch openly and frankly the problem that in case we want to keep the European Union and the European integration as a process alive, we have to agree to a transfer union, to a transfer of resources, and this requires political legitimacy. And this is the question of uh, European democracy, which from my point of view would be, um, so to say, the connecting link uh, between the national struggles and uh, European dimension, which we have to add to it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sutskar, can you comment on this? I, I, I introduced them at the beginning. I don't. <laughs> okay, maybe it's better that I introduce themselves. They know much more about themselves than I know about them. <laughs> yeah, of course, just to. Okay, please. Um. So before I introduce myself, uh, the pre my previous speaker is Walter Bayer from 
from uh, uh, Austria uh, today representing the uh, Transform Network, which is, uh, if I remember it correctly, connecting 23, 24 different institutions on the left uh, uh, in Europe, also publishing a journal also called Transform. Um, uh, sorry? No, 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 I, 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 th I think I, I, I stopped there. And my name is Karl Henrik Fredriksson. I'm a Swede, uh, uh, basically a literary critic uh, uh, and an editor, but since uh, more than a de decade involved in something called Eurosyn, which is a network of uh, almost 100 um, uh, intellectual and cultural journals from 34 countries uh, published in 32 languages in Europe. Uh, and I will now uh, somehow... Uh, play a little bit the role of the devil's advocate because it was a long time since since I uh, experienced such a, a uniform homogeneous uh, um, almost monolithic body of uh, body of uh, of discourse uh, as a yesterday evening and today, uh, this morning as well. And some of the, the thoughts uh, uh, that have been put forward uh, makes me a little bit uh, scared to fall asleep. Uh, probably the, the, uh, the one of these would be the, the Germany bashing that has been going on uh, since yesterday, uh, which is uh, based in a, in a uh, very un... Uh, diversified concept of, of neoliberalism. Uh, there's a point to what I'm saying, I will try to tie it up uh, in the end. Uh, the German form of liberalism is not neoliberalism, it's ordo liberalism. Uh, and if you don't make that dis uh, distinction, you end up in um, uh, uh, painting a picture with no gray shades uh, anywhere. And if you don't uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, the, the German uh, economic and, and, and social policy is an order liberal policy, uh, you uh, end up in uh, making caricatures of An uh, Angela Merkel in uh, Nazi uniform and, uh, and so on. And the, one of the main differences, there are many differences, but one of the main differences between order liberalism and neoliberalism uh, is that order liberalism uh, uh, wants the state to have a strong role in regulating uh, markets, for example. Uh, um, yeah, I, I will try to to tie this this uh, knots together in the end. Then um, uh, another uh, strange uh, uh, idea uh, was the the the. Uh, concept of democracy that was presented uh, yesterday, namely when uh, Slavoj said uh, uh, the, the democratic system is not enough. What you need as well is uh, the struggle on the street. Uh, I think everyone would agree on that, but what is, uh, uh, as a good morning Slavoj, that concept of democracy which makes the difference between the public sphere and the parliamentary system is, a, is long gone. It's all part of the democratic system, which means that the public sphere is part of the democratic system, which includes the street, but not least uh, also uh, the media, uh, uh, the public sphere. And this is a pillar of uh, uh, democracy, call it liberal democracy, or, uh, but I, I say it now, unqualified democracy. And uh, there, I think, is one of the key uh, issues, uh, namely the failure of the public sphere, which uh, is in my mind, one of the, the, the more uh, serious, uh, if not causes, at least not uh, 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 non-remedies in, uh, in this crisis. Uh, if the Greeks would know, or people uh, in this room uh, uh, would know, the difference between neoliberalism and order liberalism and the, the German focus on order liberalism, the understanding of the German policy would be a different one. That is not to say that it's not to criticize. There's a lot to criticize in order liberalism, but it's, the critique is a different uh, one and it's diversified. Uh, on the other hand, if the Germans would know more about what the civil war in Greek uh, has meant for, for, for Greek society and how, how uh, 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 Greek society was integrated after the Greek Civil War, uh, the Germans would not paint the, the, the Greeks uh, in the way 
uh, that that do that that they do and that type of exchange of information of uh, of of historical experiences is the task of the public sphere and uh, there is no transnational public sphere, no European public sphere, as was said in the pa panel this morning. And the reason for that is not that we don't have a common language. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, uh, media is not uh, taking its responsibility uh, when politics is changing into an international network. Uh, uh, the role of the fourth estate is also to change its role in controlling, uh, as a, the, the fourth estate con uh, controlling uh, the other uh, uh, powers in, in, in society. And this is, uh, perhaps we can talk about how, how this can be done and, and, um, uh, uh, and so later. Uh, let me just uh, finish by, so in connection with the democracy uh, uh, issue, uh, when one speaks about autonomy, there are two things I want to say. The EU was never, uh, this is a, a myth of, of, of the European Union, uh, what one says now that, well, those good old, very often social democratic days of the, the early days of the, of the uh, European integration project, uh, the European Union was, uh, back then, before it was called uh, as Avant la Lettre, was formed as a consciously undemocratic project. Uh, because it was with undemocratic means one wanted to come to terms with what had happened in the 30s and, and, and 40s. So with undemocratic means, one wanted to secure demo uh, democracy. That was part of the plan. That was not a, f a, f a failure of some sort or a fallacy uh, or a mistake. That was part of the plan. Uh, and from then, uh, one has actually moved in the direction uh, uh, of uh, more democracy. Uh, do you hear me? Because, yeah, OK. Uh, and. Um, Secondly, then, in, in connection with the, the question of autonomy, which is, uh, of course, very much connected to the question of democracy, one can take a non-EU state as Norway as a good example. I'm, I'm, I'm Swedish, I, I'm, I'm Scandinavian, uh, and I know the case uh, pretty well. Uh, Norway is rich because they found oil, so the word crisis does not really exist in the dictionary of the Norwegian language. Uh, but. Uh, the Norwegians have voted twice whether to join the European Union or not. Uh, both times, with a rather uh, small margin, they have voted no. Uh, the reason, though, in my mind, is not uh, because they um, uh, don't believe in the European project or, or, or think it's a neoliberal project or whatever. It's because they don't want to commit to a solidarity which is not... Uh, um, uh, letting them play the role of uh, uh, the good givers. Uh, outside the, the good givers, as a, a, a kind of a, 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 what is it called, charity. Uh, uh, we Scandinavians are, are really good at that. If you look at uh, 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 the help we give to the third world and so on, we like to play this role of, 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 of charity. Uh, Inside the European Union, solidarity is something else. However, to, to uh, bestow someone with development aid or whatever, uh, uh, that's you do from charity. Inside a political un uh, union or, or unity, uh, you would have to commit to something. You would really have to sacrifice something. And that, I think, is the reason behind the Scandinavian skepticism to, uh, towards the European uh, Union. However, uh, and so much for autonomy, the Norwegians, uh, the, all the EU legal and economic frameworks apply to Norway. It's just that they don't sit in there and decide on them. But they, the Schengen borders, all the, 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 the economic and legal uh, issues. Thank you, Kral. Uh, please, at the end, it's time for your intervention. Also. Okay. I will present myself. So, about the project you are in, my name is uh, Etienne Lebeau, and I uh, work in a Belgian trade union called um, CSC in the white collar sector of the Belgian trade union, uh, and we are also uh, implicated in a European project, uh, which is called the Joint Social Conference which is a group of around uh, 40 uh, social movements and critical trade unions, I would say, 
um, who tried to uh, build uh, together a common narrative of, of the crisis and beyond to build uh, a balance of forces against uh, neoliberal, neoliberal policies and post-democratic uh, Europe. Um, and so we have, uh, we have had, uh, until now, two conferences uh, last year and this year in Brussels, um, gathering many activists uh, across Europe. And so I will start from the question of the panel, which is uh, another Europe uh, is possible. Uh, of course, uh, as trade, un trade unionists, uh, the, my, my answer is yes. Uh, we are interna internationalists. Um, in a way, the European project is a, a, an irreversible fact uh, in history. So there may be a discussion about the strategy, about what a country in a particular situation can do to relieve the, the pressure which is put uh, on itself, to dis disobey uh, the, the European rules. And, uh, it's sure that uh, if we want to go get out of this crisis, uh, this democratic crisis in Europe, we will need to have uh, civil disobedience against uh, the, the, the present rules of uh, the uh, European Union and European Commission. What I want to say also is that in, in my country at least, and I think in many countries in Europe, uh, the question about uh, the contradiction between uh, Europeanism and uh, nationalism or, or uh, the, uh, a reflection centered on, on the nation state is a, a purely abstract uh, question. Most of the, the ordinary citizens uh, just, they are aware of, uh, at least confusedly, uh, in part of the problems of uh, the European Union but in the same time, uh, they are not ready to say uh, we leave the euro uh, and moreover we leave, uh, we leave the European Union. So we have to, to res respect this. Uh, there, there is a need, uh, an absolute need to uh, build another Europe, but uh, we, people just want to stay uh, in, a, in a European project. We, we just have to completely change uh, this project. So there is a kind of double bind, if you want, uh, in uh, the ordinary uh, citizen's mind, but you have to uh, acknowledge that uh, Europe is a fact in, in the spirit, uh, in the mind of uh, uh, these citizens. And the discussion is more on uh, the, the kind of strategies, but not on the perspective. Um, Another thing, another reason why we, we need to be uh, firmly uh, rooted in a, in a European uh, social project is that the project of capital is a, a coherent uh, transnational project. Uh, and so this is something that uh, most trade unions, I think, and the ETUC haven't understood uh, until now. It's that... Um, there is a coherent and transnational project in front of us. This project is um, um, carried by uh, the multinationals and more than that, the, the CEOs of the multinationals. And they are allied with uh, the, the politician leaders, or at least many uh, politician leaders. There, there is the, the history of this, uh, of this forum, which... Uh, uh, was born in 1983, which is called the European Roundtable of Industrialists. It's a very important forum that has penetrated the, the political sphere uh, of the European Union, but also of the na nation states. That's why also the, the, the debate about national European is kind of abstract. The capital has direct access uh, to, the, to the European Commission, but to the, the, the national leaders too. So uh, they don't care about this kind of border. We, we, uh, we think about the, uh, the, this border between European and national, but capital doesn't think, with this, the, the, doesn't, uh, think uh, uh, about reality li li like that. Um, 
And though, so we, we should, uh, there is another uh, distinction which is, uh, to, to my sense, much more important that national, than national European. It's the distinction between private and public. What we are uh, seeing uh, now, uh, and, and at least uh, for, for two decades, in fact, uh, in Europe, it's just the permeability of the border between private and public. Uh, the you have people who are just traveling from one sphere to another one. Uh, you have uh, uh, m uh, important political leaders like Ger Gerhard Schroeder soon after uh, he, he was uh, finished with his uh, prime ministry. He just went to, the, to the, this Russian uh, company. Um, I don't remember the name. Yes. Gazprom. So you, you have this kind of phenomenon. So the real problem right now, it's the permeability between uh, the, the, the private and, and the public sphere. There is no public sphere anymore, in fact. We have, uh, uh, we have powers, we, we have uh, state powers and European powers who, who are just uh, acting uh, on behalf uh, of capital, and this is the, the the real question. And one one of our work is to 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 make it uh, know to uh, ordinary citizens uh, to to make a, 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 an education work on this kind uh, of issues uh, to to say uh, to ordinary uh, people that uh, uh, the vice president, uh, the ex vice president of Goldman Sachs, is now at the head of uh, the European. Uh, uh, central bank, this kind of thing. We have to, to, uh, to, to, to do this. Um, and so, now about uh, the European trade unions and the ETUC, I share um, uh, the, 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 the view that was uh, brought by uh, uh, Alessandra, is, is your name, um, uh, about the fact that uh, effect, uh, effectively the, the, uh, the trade unions uh, in Europe right now are uh, very weak. Uh, when you say, you, when you see the the the, the propositions of uh, the ETUC, but also of the national confederations, it's not the problem of the ETUC itself. It's the problem of most of the national confederations, uh, trade union confederations in, in Europe. They are just, they they don't realize that. Uh, as, I, as I just explained, there is a direct access of capital to, to, uh, uh, to the political sphere. So they, they, they still think that the usual levers, the, the, usual, the usual ways for uh, the trade unions uh, to push for their claims are, are still functioning. So they, they are uh, hoping that they can improve the social dialogue and build a Europe, uh, a Europe uh, corporatism, uh, a social dialogue, a tri tripartite uh, social dialogues between uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the states, uh, between uh, capital and between uh, trade unions. But it's not working anymore. And in the present context, it is impossible that this kind of uh, dream uh, realizes. So the, the only way for, for trade unions right now is to stop dreaming about the, this kind of grand project which cannot be rebuilt in the present framework and to, to, uh, uh, to go in the street and to put pressures on uh, the political uh, leaders. Um, and also, and to finish, uh, I think the priority uh, is to build uh, a common narrative because the problem of the crisis right now is that there is such a huge gap be between the way uh, the, the Greek citizens live the crisis and the way we live and ordinary citizens live the crisis in Belgium. In Belgium right now, uh, most of the people think that it is a short-lived crisis. After two or three years of slow growth, we will get out uh, of the crisis and we can uh, uh, get back to uh, business uh, as uh, usual. Um, and so uh, Greece, uh, I'm sorry to say that for the Greek friends, but uh, for, for most of the citizens in, in Belgium, uh, Greece is like Marx, I, I, Mars, sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> Maybe like Marx also. <laughs> it's, uh, 
many many light years uh, away, and, and so we have to 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 do this work uh, to uh, to build the narrative to uh, make understand that effectively Greece is our horizon. It's the horizon of Europe right now. Um, and um, it is the laboratory, as say, uh, the, the, the Greece of the austerity policies we, which will uh, be imposed in each and every uh, European country. So this is, uh, this is also our work and this is what we are trying to do with instruments like uh, uh, the joint uh, social uh, conference. Uh, it's a tough work. Right now, I would say the, 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 the limit of the joint social conference is that it's an activist thing. And the, the challenge is to make, uh, to, to root it in the, um, um, in, in, in the, the basis of uh, the organization, especially uh, of uh, the trade unions uh, all uh, uh, over Europe. And uh, that's we, what we are trying uh, right now to do, to build uh, a political subjectivity, as uh, it was said uh, this, this morning. This is uh, what we are trying to do uh, right now. Okay, uh, thank you, Etienne. Now it's time to open the discussion also for the audience. Just wait. For the audience and also for, uh, for you to comment if you want the interventions of other, uh, other participants. I will we now take maybe three. Uh, three questions, and then after the other session, questions. Is not, uh, does anybody carry the mic? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Mati, I come from a group called Marx21 from Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, I, I'd like to pose like something uh, that, that, that's that been the question of the day, basically, and that will be uh, tomorrow's question, but it, the answer to the question kind of uh, keeps slipping away. When we're talking about uh, another kind of Europe, um, I'm, I'm really not sure whether we're, we are talking about uh, taking over the, the uh, present institutions of EU and somehow changing their uh, substance or we are trying to dismantle them. I think this is, uh, f f for us on the left, this is the, 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 like the, 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 the core strategic question that, th that is the first thing we have to answer. Uh, whether we are like uh, uh, Serbia, for example, uh, uh, outside EU and in the process of EU integ integration or uh, uh, we are uh, uh, active in within one of the, the EU countries because um, f from what I can tell from the outside basically when looking at the EU uh, especially uh, these days uh, in Greece and Italy uh, uh, basically the measures that, 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 that the Troika is passing are being uh, put into praxis uh, via the national governing bodies okay so uh, and uh, when when they lose when they get into the political crisis the, the crisis of of legitimacy as as it is in in Greece for example these days they're just being put aside you you have you have this kind of of soft bonapartism uh, uh, from the EU uh, uh, bureaucracy where, where they can basically uh, 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 put up uh, an unelected government government to uh, to to pass their their resolution so i think uh, now, when we are talking about another Europe, we, we first have to see, you know, whether, whether we, we think that we can actually use those institutions that are nowadays uh, imposing undemocratically measures uh, 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 to, to, to some peoples who are, who are not, uh, basically, who do not want to listen uh, to, to their austerity stories. Um, and, and they're doing it brutally because they're using not only austerity measures, but more and more state repression, which is a practical problem for the movement for us in Serbia. It is it is a problem, uh, and we really do not have something that could be called a, a, like like a big movement or something. But anything that happens, uh, 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 basically, uh, uh, that is confront is confronted by by state repression. So I mean, I think that yeah, I'd like to hear what's what's your opinion. Do we do we take over the EU or do we dismantle EU and start building solidarity from below uh, uh, among? you know, throughout regions or whatever. Thank you. 
All right, works now. Um, I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina, neighboring countries. <clears throat> um, I just want to add something to that. Do we really need to get inside the system and change it, or do we really need to dismantle the system? Can we just make a parallel one? <laughs> you know, I mean, we're all leftists over here, and there is no left Europe organized together. I mean, the right is obviously organized very well, and um, I think they're taking a lot advantage of that, but we're not. So I just want to throw that in as a third option. Yeah. Thank you. I am Orien Rijanovic. Uh, the question of this tribune is, if, is it possible another Europe? I think that's not a question. We must know if we know, if we have a knowledge. Some people know. Some people have knowledge. For instance, me. We must say, if it is possible, better Europe, better. Better people, better nature, better work, that means economy, agriculture, uh, education, culture, uh, healthcare system, administration, judiciary system, security system, military, civil, and so on. And, and, and at the end, very important, very important, time. People in the nature, with the nature, working in the time. We must think on time. Europe is losing his time. Europe is great system. The greatest system, it is greater than China now. Because it, let me talk about China, that's two, two, 200 million people, not more. Other are peasants without education, without any co connection with. The, oh, you, we must know that this system. We must have another approach. Work approach. Europe is a great system. Europe level, and when you have said you, Mr. I don't remember, excuse me, I, not, I haven't remembered your name, uh, it's a great system. It's a reality. But you must, you must know how to handle it, to control it, and uh, supervise it. Then that's level of uh, some sub region or specific state, then groups, towns, land, South Africa, Ukraine, and uh, individuals. If you approach that problem, I must say uh, there are a lot of questions. <laughs> Europe is a great problem uh, because you see you are, you are pushing towards the problems which are not problems, they are working problems. From Greece, they are working problems. Greece is problem of Greece and Europe. If you give some, somebody money, you must know whom you are giving money and why you are giving money. They were giving the Greece money without any control, supervising. And Greece, I, I'm not talking stupid things. I'm sorry, but we have to move on. We have a limited time. Because you are talking. Well, what do you think? What do you think? Oh, that's not fair. That's not democratic. Five minutes is enough for, for, for me. <laughs> Are you from Tujman or from Russian? Previous uh, very failure politicians. No, that's that's true. That's 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 the shame of Croatia. They have shamed Croatia. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you? Can Europe be better? Knowledge is main thing. If you knowledge to manage all those levels and specifically persons, groups, states, you can do it. That's a great system in our country. In our country, they are not capable to run this town tramway. You know that. And they are only top level. Top level of the, of, of the ministers or so on. Thank you very much. I am Orion Rijanovic. I am not a great Greek. I am with them, but you must work. They must work. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Um, let me take the thread because you, you had asked me. Yeah, because you, you had asked me if 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 I accept you as a prime minister of Greece. Yes, yes. Uh, and which is which is a question that I cannot answer, to be honest. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, so. Uh, there was a question by, by a friend and comrade here regarding, uh, I mean, should we, we take over the, the institutions of the EU and change them or dismantle them altogether? I, I don't think that one can give a clear answer to this. Uh, I, I think that... Uh, if we accept that we must fight at the national level and try to coordinate at the European level and give our vision for a different Europe, we will never know what will happen at the end. Because Europe can be dissolved, Europe can change. What we have to do is to do our job. And doing our job, especially, well, uh, as far as Greece is concerned at this moment, is to, to, to try and, well, because some people said it here, I think probably you, it's not only, what is being done is in Greece, is not only a dictate from the European Union. There are uh, political forces and, uh, and uh, fractions of capital in Greece that are really very happy with what is happening. I mean, they wouldn't have ever dreamed that uh, 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 collective agreements would be uh, demolished within one day. Uh, they wouldn't have ever dreamed that uh, uh, wages in the private sector would be lowered to the degree of uh, uh, wages in Bulgaria or Romania. And uh, who who can tell me or the other people what this has to do with public debt? Has it anything to do with public debt, lowering the wages in the private sector? So I, I think that that's what we, we have to do. It's what, and this is part of the collective narrative that, as you said before, uh, that we need to, to communicate to our people in all countries. Uh, because the, the question is not that uh, some Belgians uh, see that uh, Greece is like Mars. They can send a spaceship to, to, to Mars and see uh, how it is. The, the problem is that uh, they are victims of a, of a propaganda that tells them that if you don't comply with what we ask you to do on... Uh, say, a consensual basis at that moment, at the end, you will be like Greece. And this is a, a, something that we must confront in common, because, it, I mean, because we have a common faith. And that there is one thing that the European uh, Union, uh, which incidentally, it's something that I forgot to say in the morning, uh, European Union institutions contain recently the IMF also, if, if I mean, we had forgotten to say that, it is that uh, they, they try to impose this to, to every country. And in that way, they can homogenize resistance, which is very important. It's really very important. Um, just, uh, I beg to differ from what uh, Etienne has said uh, just a few moments ago. The fact that there's no public sphere, public sphere in the sense of Öffentlichkeit and of public rights, it is not true. The fact that there are questionable politicians going in and out, that doesn't uh, change the basic character of bourgeois society that works through jurisprudence through jurisdiction and through legislation. 
one of the, the, the fundamental methods uh, in the last 300 years of imposing discipline, a discipline I disagree with and I'm very happy to, 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 to besiege and to attack, but uh, in, order to, in order to attack our enemy, it is quite important to understand him or her or them or it. And, um, and um, to say that the fact that you know, a, a politician has been formerly a private banker or after his term as a chan federal chancellor is, in Gapstrom, is really not interesting. It is not nice, it is not seemly, uh, it is perhaps dishonest, but when somebody acts as uh, a responsible politician with the prerogatives and rights of his function is one thing and then he leaves and does something else is also something else. And the, f the way in which capitalism as a system influences politics, legislation, jurisprudence, all that, is not informal. The informal part of it is quite important, but it's much more important how the whole constitutional system, including the European constitutional system, imposes capitalism as a legal framework which has been well understood by somebody called Karl Marx, who said in the capital that one of the most important thing about an analyzing capitalism is to understand that equality and liberty in the capitalist system are not only epiphenomenal appearances, but on, from one aspect, these societies are free and equal, and through their version of political rights are imposing exploitation and oppression and inequality on citizens, because these people, are, you know, citizens exist but actually you know the separation of citizens from private persons is the basic characteristic of bourgeois society and this is assured by the legal system it is not corruption which is the main method through which or you know illicit influences the method by which the order is imposed it is the legal very legal very legitimate very very public decrees and laws and constitutions and armies and police and courts and parliaments through which the system is being imposed. That's one thing. And secondly, I didn't understand you, Carl, when you said that uh, on the one hand there have been the public sphere, by which you meant the street, and then parliament and the media, uh, uh, are those not public institutions? Are they not public in the sense of öffentlich? Are they not known? You know, the, the, what is structured as domination and what is indeed a free space for the citizens for their self-activity, they're both in the public domain and in the public domain there is something what we call struggle. And um, so, so it is not you know, I, I really uh, would warn anybody to, to, to think that the uh, dominion of capital is something illegal, illicit, and secret. It's out there. It's visible. It's official. It's legitimate. It's recognized. And it is, you know, and there's a complex system in which there are many levels, including the European level and the world level and so on and so forth. So this brings me to your questions. Um, well, first of all, when you ask, should we dismantle the European... Well, should we? Well, okay, I'm for it. Who, who will come with me? And uh, so, uh, so it's, that's a good question, but also indecent. Uh, because, because we just don't have the force to do it. But what should we wish? Most certainly not a dispositive of oppression like the European Union and like the bourgeois nation states as well. Of course they should be destroyed. Well, is there any question about this in this room? Uh, well, Marxists, aren't we? Well, you know, uh, well, you know, and we should indeed destroy them if we can. The question is when do we, uh, you know, when, what do we, well, meanwhile, meanwhile, you know, of course you have to exercise pressure from the outside. Why should we exercise pressure from the outside? Because we're weak. Why are we acting on the streets? 
and why I'm not, not taking, uh, taking over the banks and the ministries and the army and the police and the chief prosecutor's office and the universities and so on. Well, because we are, don't have the force. And the fact is that, that, that bourgeois society is of a nature that gives us a very small room of maneuver, very small, but still exists in the room of maneuver, in which we can, you know, use the cleavages between the various parts of the public sphere and in which we can uh, insist on our rights, in which we can try to influence governments. Well, after all, aren't you participating in elections? Of course, you know. You know, honest communist parties are, you know, running in elections, aren't they? And because they're using this for the limited for the limited goals that can be attained through elections, very limited ones, as you will see very soon if we can greet with great joy Alexis Tsipras as the new Prime Minister of Greece, you know, in June. And um, what he would be able to do won't be what he would like to do. That's clear. <laughs> yes, we help. Yes, absolutely. And we should help. And, uh, and, and Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, you're absolutely right, and uh, and you know, it, it is absolutely. Rhetoric is knowledge, and um, I'm just doing it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, the thing is that 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 we have to take the enemy very seriously, and also we have to take our desires very seriously. So our weakness. And our disorganization, quite right. Yes, the right is well. Well, they are the power. Obviously, they are well organized. And our force also is in our not being organized. Okay? And we won't, we won't function like an army. We won't function like an apparat. We won't function like a dispositive. We cannot be outguessed by them. And that's the power of the weak. Good. And um, the power of the oppressed. We have our own kind of power, and, but we have to understand ourselves, we take our desires seriously. We should not think that what we desire is a utopia, is it impossible, we shouldn't think about it, we should think about it. For a very serious reason, because we have to have the pleasure of expressing our desires, of thinking about them, and of desiring, actually doing the desiring, yes. And if we desire revolution, that should be in, in our thoughts. Just one more sentence, and then I'll leave out two more opportunities to speak. Right? And so, and uh, but at the same time, at the same time, we should take seriously uh, uh, capitalism as a legal system, as a system of calculating the economy in a mathematical way, the way in which knowledge and the spirit is colonized by capitalism and used to increase uh, profits and plus value. It is a destructive and a creative force we should play with, understand, take seriously, and uh, not think that it is an occult conspiracy somewhere in the back room. It's there out in the open, including, unfortunately, our own heads. Sorry. Okay, uh, now, Alessandro, then you do. Respond to Gaspar's critique. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I just want uh, now to say something less dark than the first thing, because the, well, the dark is uh, what is happening uh, and what is the situation. Uh, the less dark, I think, maybe not brilliant, but uh, a little bit more light, with more light, is what uh, we. Uh, can do, what we have in our hands in order to uh, make uh, happen something and something better and uh, a different Europe. I also agree with Aris that there is no answer, I mean, it's not in our hands the answer to the question that was raised by you before, either we dismantle or we change. I think that the, the, what we have in our hands, and I think that we have in our hands, although the very difficult um, situation and stage uh, we live now, is uh, to change something, how to change something. And what is, in my opinion now, 
uh, in a sense better, two things. One is uh, the, the, the continuous, uh, although sometimes not very visible, but the continuous working uh, and the struggling and uh, be visible of the different movements, social movements different uh, in uh, different ways, but different uh, that uh, we used to have uh, uh, 10 years or so, uh, Yes, 10 years ago, the European for Social Forum, before the World Social Forum, and so on. And this is going on. What happened in the last uh, years is, from one side, the crisis, uh, but from the other side, new actors and new social actors that have been mentioned this morning, uh, and that we all of us know, like the Indignados, like the movement Occupy, like the, the, what Lorenzo said about the, the victory of the referendum against the nuclear and against privatization in Italy, and so on. So the movement is there, and the different movements are there. Fragmented, but are there. Second point is uh, uh, just, I mentioned this because this morning has been, um, many things has been said, and tomorrow more, about the result of elections. Uh, that I agree, uh, I think it was Elizabeth this morning saying about the French elections, and I think the, the, the evaluation can be the same for all the elections, including the locally Italian elections, that uh, uh, there is, uh, the door is open. But there is, the solution is not there, but the door is open now more than before. In Italy there was a crash of the two main parties, uh, of the alliance of the governmental parties, uh, the Berlusconi party and the Lega, the most racist party, the uh, crash of them also, I mean, the alliance was broken and the two parties also. I cannot say that it was uh, uh, the, the left uh, successful, no. The left is not, well, the left is very complicated to say what it is <laughs> now in Italy, so I don't want to go into this detail. Maybe tomorrow something uh, more, but it was not successful. The success is now for the people, the rage and the protest of the people. That fortunately is not going to the extreme right wing. It's possible that will go, but now is not going there. So, these two uh, things, uh, Movements uh, on the road <laughs> and uh, changing in uh, political frameworks uh, somewhere. And what is important with the uh, idea that it's possible to say no to the dictat of the uh, European Union. This is possible. This is what uh, is not enormous thing, but what Hollande says, said uh, in France. It is possible to say no, because up to now, not possible. Not possible even in Italy, all the parties joined the opinion that we have to support Monti because he's uh, uh, giving the, the implementation of the European uh, orientation. And also what... Yes, <laughs> uh, and they imposed the, the, to make dismissal easier. What has to do this with the uh, growth? What has to do this with the employment of young people? We want the growth, but we make dismissals easier. This is an absurdity, but what the, the problem is, is start to say no with the political weight and with the social weight in the, the street. So I conclude in saying that uh, I agree uh, with what uh, what said but by um, my um, Belgian colleague and I think also by others, uh, the fact that what we need in order to build up something that is in our hands is uh, to rebuild a, a European uh, public space. We don't have this. We don't have an European space where to put together all the different experience. We have no European space now where we, ha we can converge on common actions. We don't have this, and we need this. And so the final point is that we are working uh, after uh, 10 years uh, of the first European Social Forum in Florence, we are working in Italy to create uh, a new, it's not the celebration of course, but it's to, restart, to start to recreate a space, at least to contribute to recreate a space, 
because we see that there are a lot of uh, European initiatives like this one, but there was the one, the Joint Social Conference in Brussels, and there was another one, and they, yes. I close saying that we invite all of you to this European Florence 10 plus 10 that will take place in November in Florence, 1 to 4 of November. It will be open, of course, to uh, all those who want to participate in European large sense and also from the southern uh, um, shore of the Mediterranean because it's the place where uh, I think uh, a new movement that is started with the Arab revolutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Carl and Etienne, please, your responses. I think it might be better if I do it like this. Um, <clears throat> I try to take all the, the questions, a risky endeavor, but all, all the questions uh, seriously. Uh, first of all, to the public sphere, that was exactly what I meant. The street, uh, the media, uh, the uh, uh, parliament uh, and so on and so forth are all part of the democratic system. It was presented before as if the street was outside the democratic system. It's part of the public sphere and therefore a pillar of, of democracy and uh, therefore it cannot be used as a critique of uh, the democratic system. That was my, my point. And my second point was then about the media and uh, this is exactly what we heard now as the lack of a of a, a public space, of a public sphere, which is uh, transnational, truly uh, transnational. I don't think that it has to be uh, as difficult as it was presented uh, this morning, namely that you, which uh, has also been the view of, of Jürgen Habermas for a long time, that you need a new European media and therefore you would have the language problem. And since we don't have a common language, uh, this will not happen. Uh, I think it's perfectly uh, uh, enough uh, if uh, the national, already established national public spheres open up somewhat to the other national public spheres and mirror them in themselves and this uh, will then create a, a, a series of interconnected public spheres that in the end makes up this uh, European public sphere that in turn can uh, work as the uh, uh, legitimizing uh, body for uh, transnational political institutions. Uh, and this uh, then uh, is also connected to uh, the question about uh, can Europe be better? Uh, uh, and uh, the answer to that, as I understand it, is knowledge. Uh, and this uh, was a little bit, ex probably not in the way that you meant it, but this was a little bit what I was after as well. Uh, namely, uh, only uh, knowledge about the situation of the other uh, can be uh, the beginning and the, the basis of, of transnational solidarity. And the only way to achieve that is via using the, 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 the public sphere. Uh, thirdly, then, to the question about uh, transforming or, or dismantling uh, the uh, European institutions uh, or setting up a parallel system, I'm very much with Gaspar uh, Miklos Tomas on this uh, issue. Uh, it's not a, a viable option at the moment to dismantle it. However, I think that the European left, uh, not least in Scandinavia, perhaps uh, mostly in Scandinavia, but in other places as well, have uh, uh, wasted decades in uh, uh, refuting uh, uh, the European Union as a fact uh, and therefore not uh, uh, therefore refusing to take part in forming these institutions and forming these uh, 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 political uh, th these political institutions and decades have, have really been been wasted uh, on, on this instead of uh, uh, trying to change them uh, yeah it could be uh, uh, I think it must have been 20 years ago, probably only 15, but it could also be 20 years ago that Pierre Bourdieu and Jacques Derrida as well, but above all Pierre Bourdieu uh, uh, wrote a famous article uh, uh, about the trade unions. Trade unions of Europe unite. Uh, and he qualified that then a, a, a little bit and it was trade unions of the world, of course, but, but still. He identified then and, and uh, many on the, on the left identified the trade unions as a key player in order to create a social Europe. Uh, not leave it to, to uh, the neoliberal. Nothing. Nothing has happened since then. Uh, and it's 20 years ago. Uh, one can sit and, and uh, 
but what the trade unions then did was instead, for example, in the Scandinavian countries, to, to say no to the European Union, not to act with their uh, members in, in, in uh, as their, their uh, colleagues in other, in other sets. And this is what I mean with wasting decades uh, 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 in refuting rather than, than uh, doing things. Uh, and finally, then, uh, uh, as a, to build a common uh, narrative, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical about grand narratives, uh, but uh, there are things uh, that have been done there. Uh, 15 years ago, again, the Tobin tax was something considered uh, utopian, if not insanely radical. Uh, and this was part of the of the uh, is another world uh, another world is possible movement. This is the key uh, political uh, practical suggestion of that movement. This is now being accepted by more or less all uh, actors in the uh, European political institutions. Is that far from being being uh, uh, introduced uh, and uh, shows that there are absolute possibilities uh, for this type of, of, if you want to call it, leftist um, uh, approach. And then finally, because I thought that we would get into a, a, a discussion on democracy, that will come tomorrow. Of course, there will be an interesting panel on democracy tomorrow. But uh, again, to this, uh, I don't think that there is, that many people also during these days here do so, that uh, the problem of democracy is something that has been introduced uh, because of the introduction of transnational politics. Uh, uh, democracy, uh, representative democracy, is not uh, in crisis only on the transnational level, it's just as much in crisis on the national level. And therefore, this is again not an argument against uh, a transnational system, uh, at least not as you would, you in German would call Totschlag argument. Uh, 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 they have to be analyzed a little bit uh, differently, but democracy is in crisis on all levels, uh, and uh, not, uh, it's not only a transnational poli uh, politics problem. Okay, uh, just uh, about your uh, interpolation. Um, of course, uh, I'm not uh, thinking that the, the influence of capital most of the times goes through illegal ways. There, there is no, no correspondence or at least exact correspondence between the two. It's at the level of uh, ideology. And I think one of the important ways in which um, capital is such a, an influence on the, the political system is because he has be, it has been able in the last decades to appropriate whole fields of uh, expertise and, and knowledge, uh, especially at the level of uh, financial markets. Uh, uh, I think one of the problems we have to uh, um, uh, convince people that we should uh, go to uh, uh, public banks and uh, a public financial system is that uh, many people are aware that uh, uh, the expertise in the, is in the end of uh, private hands, private bankers. And, um, and for example, we, we had um, uh, the, the bankruptcy of uh, the, the bank uh, Dexia in, uh, in Belgium a few, uh, few months ago. And at the moment, uh, the bankruptcy happened. Uh, the, the government asked uh, another investment bank to investigate on the Dexia case and to give him advice about wha what he, he, sh he should do uh, in front of this bankruptcy. And the, the bank they chose was uh, UBS which is one of the worst bank in the world. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is the way it works. And, uh, uh, and, and just most of the media, of course, they don't talk of the fact that UBS uh, had uh, many uh, fiscal scandals. They, they may, don't make a connection between what happened in UBS with, with uh, fiscal scandals uh, one or two years ago and, what, uh, and what, what was the decision of the Belgian government when, when uh, it asked uh, UBS to intervene. So this kind of connection is not made. And that's why 
uh, there is such um, an indifference uh, in front of uh, it's, it's at least one of the reasons why, why there is such uh, an indifference in the public about this kind of uh, uh, of problems. Um, and there are numerous, m numerous other cases where you, you see the influence of uh, uh, finance on the, the public sphere. In the United States, there is also the famous uh, uh, example of uh, uh, this, um, uh, this public servant uh, who, who wanted to uh, regulate uh, financial derivatives and we, we, who, who, had, who was just uh, um, uh, obliged to... Uh, um, to dismissal uh, because of the opposition of the banks and of the, the political figures who are representatives of the banks in, in the government. So there are a, a lot of examples, but I think one, one of the uh, uh, evolutions, uh, important evolution is the appropriation of expertise by uh, private actors and the, the fact that there is uh, um, the, the in, in the public politi political sphere and in the governments, uh, there is just a lack of expertise on a number of affairs, uh, mo most of all uh, fi financial uh, uh, affairs, uh, so, which is uh, to say you have to rebuild this kind of expertise. One of the stakes uh, linked to, uh, to uh, public banks, it, it would be to rebuild an expertise among uh, civil servants on the financial matters, to have a, 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 a technocratical elite uh, on this kind uh, of, uh, of affairs. So, so you can uh, reappropriate uh, uh, the expertise and take it from the hands of uh, private actors. So there are numerous channels, I think, of course, it's not only a, a conspiracy of a, or li illegal channels which make uh, corruption. There are more subtle, uh, subtle ways um, and that's just what I wanted to say I want more or less refer to the question of the common firstly the common space I I, I think we desperately need such a European common space maybe even we need European common spaces I mean uh, frames in which people can come together not only social movements trade union trade unionists but also political actors for me the one of the decisive experiences of the World Social Forum indeed was 2003 these 15 or 20 million people out of the street on the streets without being able to prevent the war. And this, of course, has to do with not being present on the level of institutions and of power. And if we want to restructure our strategy, we have to, to encompass all these different spheres of public and political spaces. And secondly, I want to refer to uh, the notion of the common narrative. Um, yes. And at the same time, I always feel uncomfortable with the term narrative because it implies uh, that there are different narratives and the most performing is then that one which prevails. And I would say regarding the crisis, what we need is a reasonable, rational explanation of that what the crisis is about. And this is a scientific struggle and it would help us to overcome uh, uh, a series of um, contradictions in the debate. For example, um, the question of the European institutions. I fully agree that it is impossible to say at the moment what will happen with the European institutions in a certain moment. This is a question of a struggle. For example, the European Central Bank can we accept that the Euro European Central Bank is bound to the target of uh, monetary stability only? And in case we do not agree to that, then we have to change it. And we will have to change not only its mandate and its relation to the political bodies, we will also have to change the composition of its management. 
Because if you look at the management board of the European Central Bank, you find there the same structure as in the most other spaces of the European Union. Namely, these are rep representatives, formally not, but inofficially yes, of different European nations and nation states, and the most important ones are those with the uh, most influence. We will have to change it, but I do not at all agree with the idea which was raised uh, in the morning uh, by Samir who said, well, the European Central Bank, it is bound to monetary stability and that's why we have to abolish it. I mean, this, this is, sorry to say so, this is apolitical. It's not the question that we can do this at the moment is a question that we can provoke discussions on it. And if we discuss this in the public spaces, people will understand better what the political confrontation in Europe is about. And this is our duty. And uh, then uh, secondly, um, as uh, regards the, the narrative, and in this sense, I think uh, it's, it describes something uh, quite quite appropriately. Namely, there is a competition on interpretation of that what is going on um, in uh, Europe. And the main hypotheses under scrutiny are the hypotheses of the nationalists and the other ones are of those who somehow link critical analysis of society with domination and with class theory. And uh, in that sense, I would like that we become more precise um, in terms of terminology. One of the uh, questions raised, for example, was uh, should we um, be outside the system in order to change it or should we inside the system? Well, of course, the European Union is a sort of a system, but among leftists, referring to system normally means capitalist system, and we should not accept the confusion between the capitalist system with its structures of domination and with its economic rules with uh, the state system or the, uh, the, the setting of the national uh, relations within uh, a certain territory. If we accept this confusion, we are halfway on interpreting the crisis in nationalist terms. And this is important to be precise on this. It's not about the Euro. It's not about the European Union. It's about the idea that markets can regulate society. And this is not an innocent idea. This is the idea of those who are the powerful at the markets. And this is the idea of how exploitation would function most smoothly for them. And we have to be stubborn on this. Uh, I think uh, that um, among a lot of um, cultural challenges in front of us, uh, one of the biggest ones is to refuse nationalism, to fight nationalism. And by the way, also referring to the debate uh, this morning, I find completely abstract if uh, you f refer to Europe in terms of national sovereignty only. Because there is a difference between the national sovereignty of Germany, France, and of Croatia, and of Austria on the other side. This is not the same thing. And if you level this, you abstract from existing inequalities. And this is not a question of being just or unjust. This is one of the sources why in small and little European countries, nationalism can grow. Because people have the impression that Europe is only about two big nations. Which is false because Europe is about class. And secondly, of course, Europe consists of 27. And if you put together then the countries and states outside of the European, much more of this. And I think all these aspects of the problem create the complexity, and in this complexity lies the challenge for the left, but at the same time it's chance, because it's the only force who can make sense out of this. Thank you, Walter. Now we will finish with your words, and thank you all for participating. It's, it's five o'clock, so this panel is, is finished. Thank you all. Uh,
Uh, we will see tomorrow here at 10 with the next panel called the, the role of the European left. Now we have two hours break and at 7 o'clock at Kino Europa there is a lecture by Saskia Sassen, the global street making the political. Thank you all.